I know that Dan doesn't need much of an introduction, but he's perhaps best known as the whistleblower who released the Pentagon Papers to hasten an end to the war in Vietnam. Uh, Dan was an analyst at Rand Corporation and a consultant to the Defense Department specializing in problems of command and control of nuclear weapons, war plans, and crisis decision making. Last year, he released his critically acclaimed memoirs, America's Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner. In, in 2009, Dan was the subject of a documentary called The Most Dangerous Man in America, Daniel Ellsberg and the Pentagon Papers. So it's a particular honor and privilege to call The Most Dangerous Man in America. Con addressing people, all of whom know that the grand bargain of the NPT has been a hoax and that the Article 6 requirement that the nuclear powers negotiate in good faith for the total elimination of nuclear weapons has never been meant in good faith by any American president, probably any of the other leaders, one second in the over half a century that they've made that claim. Instead, we've got a situation that we had in 1983. Both powers armed to the teeth and continue a huge buildup, essentially of first strike weapons, weapons, many of which the ICBMs in particular can't survive an enemy attack, have to be used rather than be lost and have to get over fast to destroy the counterforce and the counterforce attack that will destroy the opposing ICBMs in particular and its command and control systems. There's always been what seemed like a very irrational aspect to these plans. In particular, the notion of decapitation, which I encountered when I was working on war plans in 1961 in the Pentagon, has always seemed to me to have an insane tinge. It went along with plans to win the war with acceptable casualties, to prevail in some sense, to have more defensive and more offensive weapons than the other side had at the end, to have fewer casualties. And yet the idea of depriving an adversary with thousands actually of nuclear weapons dispersed ICBMs and SLBMs in particular in the subs, to deprive them of any ability to control those in a central way, which was the object of decapitation, seem to me to assure that there was no way to stop the war, to end it, to win it, certainly, to achieve coercive control in a post-war world. Who were you bargaining with? Who were you negotiating with? Uh, who were, how, how were these terms acceptable or favorable to the United States, which our war plans aimed at, to be achieved? And with whom? One reason they kept the idea of decapitation, which by the way, President Putin has just uh, talked about recently, about his ability to do that and even name the targets that he would hit, about six of them, with offshore submarines. Uh, if, for example, we uh, modified our ballistic missile defenses in Romania and Europe to be ground launch missiles that could hit Moscow within a few minutes, decapitating them. Now, his offshore submarines, uh, they're indefinitely said could hit Washington and off it and NORAD and everything else. Now, that holds out the prospect that a nuclear war uh, initiated, by, initiated by one side could win entirely by paralyzing the other entirely. And that's not impossible, quite. Uh, but it's pretty close to impossible because neither side has wanted to make it possible to be paralyzed by a shot on one command post or a handful of them. And each has prepared arrangements that under any circumstances of destruction of our command and control, surviving weapons, and there will be surviving weapons, will fire various targets. How many does it take actually uh, to be sure that you will receive 
uh, to deter an adversary or a state that can be deterred at all? That's the question that Herbert York asked back in 1982 at his old lab, the Livermore Nuclear Weapons Lab, which, of which he'd been the first director, after which he became director of research and engineering in the Pentagon. How many weapons does it take to deter an enemy that is rational enough to be deterred at all? And he suggested one, or perhaps 10. He was quoting McGeorge Bundy, who worked under Kennedy and Johnson, who had written in Foreign Affairs that any decision that brought even one weapon down on a city, one's own country, would be regarded as a catastrophic blunder. 10 would be uh, a disaster beyond all history. The effect on a country of losing 10 major cities or say 20 the most, or five, be absolutely unprecedented and uh, in catastrophic consequences to the society. Winning after that would be a, a mockery. Or surviving as a society, the idea of being a democratic society after that, which we sometimes talk about, is absurd. And he said a hundred would be unthinkable. Well, unthinkable or not, uh, our own plans at that very time when he spoke envisioned burning many hundreds of cities always. And that's true on both sides. And although Nixon in particular, in view of the genocide convention, uh, which he wanted to ratify at last, uh, took cities per se off the target list ever since, uh, the target list remained essentially the same. Nuclear targets in the cities, military targets in the cities, have always assured as Samuel Butler, uh, rather George Lee Butler, the uh, last commander of strategic air command, first commander of strategic command found when he came into office, uh, every city uh, in the late eighties, now uh, the early nineties after the cold war remained on the target list and would be burned uh, just as was true more than 20 years earlier when I worked on the plans. In between, something that neither McGeorge Bundy nor Herbert York took into account, although uh, it, uh, the facts came out the very year that York made this proposal, that something between one, ten, and a hundred nuclear warheads, survivable nuclear warheads, were enough to deter an attack that could be deterred. It was that very, he got to the hundred by asking the question, what's the maximum destruction that we would want any human commander to be able to inflict in a day or a week. And he took just hypothetically the total damage and deaths of World War II, 60 million. And that would be achieved, he said, by 100, 100 kiloton weapons. Uh, <clears throat> so he said something between one and 10 and 100 would be adequate for deterrence and uh, uh, closer to one than 100. We had at that time, or in the 80s, uh, tens of thousands of nuclear weapons. When Eisenhower came into office, uh, Truman had left a thousand A-bombs. Uh, I've found, and some of you can find by asking an audience, almost no Americans know the difference between an A-bomb and an H-bomb. It's simple as that, it's sort of grade one in a, in a grade school, lesson one in a grade school course on nuclear weapons. Uh, under Eisenhower, the H-bomb, which uses the A-bomb, the Nagasaki type bomb, as its trigger came into being. The first one was exactly 1,000 times the yield of, uh, <clears throat> of a uh, uh, atomic bomb, fission bomb, the kind that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. By the end of Eisenhower's term, we had 23,000 nuclear weapons, uh, most of them thermonuclear. And after Kennedy and Johnson, 37,000. When the Russians got eventually some 40,000 weapons, there was a total of about 70,000 weapons in the world. In the world, as I say, deterrence alone uh, would uh, call for something between one and a hundred, closer to one than a hundred. Something more like, in other words, the British 
or the French have on their deployed submarine right now. They could have more than that, but they don't load it up to the full loading of missiles. And with one submarine in sea, the British, for example, seem to plan about 40 warheads to give them strong deterrence. Uh, what then are these other weapons even thought of as being for? They don't have enough cities for them to hit. Well, they're not mostly targeted cities at all. In fact, none of them are targeted explicitly at cities, although they burn the city by hitting command and control or transport. In their minds, they're for the case that deterrence may occur. I'm sorry, their nuclear war may occur. And in that case, we would want to use our weapons rather than have them be lost and use them to an effect that will serve our purposes to some extent after the war by reducing the damage of the nuclear war. By hitting the other side's forces, even if most of them have left their silos, there will be some left, there will be reloads that can be prevented, command and control to perhaps paralyze some of them. So the damage will be less if we get those weapons off and not fire them just at the ocean, uh, but at counterforce targets on the other side. Both sides have worked then on highly accurate weapons that can destroy silo-based uh, ICBMs. We all understand, I think, in this audience, and most people even in the, in the country understand, that an anti-ballistic missile defense, which Reagan wanted, and which Tr Reagan, uh, Trump is again emphasizing, is a hoax a jobs program, a facade that will not prevent damage, it will not limit damage to us in a war between the US and Russia. A very small exchange against uh, someone smaller than North Korea or even North, North Korea, with a handful of ICBMs might have some effect, but against Russia, no effect. What has not been realized is that our counterforce uh, efforts, plans, which are the bulk of our offensive vehicles, and always have been, uh, aimed at reducing damage, but are exactly the hoax that ABM is. There is no more chance that firing those weapons will reduce uh, the damage to the United States significantly in order to make a perceptible difference between the uh, uh, war in which uh, they had been used and ha or had not been used that they will prevent the entire destruction of American society is false. And yet hundreds of billions, scores of billions, ultimately hundreds of billions of dollars are spent on each side uh, to reduce damage in that way in the event of a war um, to no effect at all, any more than ABM, uh, if we're done. Now, how could this be? Well, let's go back to Reagan's apparently uh, valid statement, uh, or uh, realistic statement, back in 1983, for actually, the State of the Union message, a nuclear war cannot be won and must not be fought, must not ever be fought. That we joined in that by Gorbachev later, and that was regarded as a, <laughs> at last recognizing a real reality. And yet the arms race went on at that point after saying that, as before. Well, no inconsistency. What he had not said was the truth. Revealed that year, especially when nuclear winter became known in 1983, was that a nuclear war could not have its damage limited. It can't only not be won. A nuclear war cannot destroy destruction. You can't survive a nuclear war, not just that you can't win it. Uh, there are no uh, actual aims in, in a nuclear war that are achievable other than perhaps stopping it if you haven't decapitated uh, the other side and you have not yourself been decapitated. That rules out ending it. It's the only uh, possible goal that makes any sense. Uh, <clears throat> Reagan did not say nuclear war must not be threatened and must not be prepared for uh, to limit damage or to win or to do any other delusory uh, goal, but you must not get yourself ready for a nuclear war. And the main reason we get ready for a nuclear war is not this insurance about actually using it, but to threaten and back up our use of initiating tactical nuclear weapons. 
with the aim of saying, don't respond to our tactical nuclear weapons, our short range, smaller weapons against your conventional forces, lest we accept, escalate to an all out attack with the hope of um, uh, limiting our damage in that case and doing better than if we waited for you to escalate uh, yourself. Each side has been engaged in doing this now for over 25 years. Uh, the threats, in other words, have involved preparations to make them credible, which in turn raise an actual probability of the war actually occurring. How does that happen? Because the ICBMs can only survive if they're launched before they're hit, uh, before the attack occurs. And so our warning system, very expensive on both sides, the Russian having become less reliable with their loss of the Warsaw Pact, but both sides have warning systems and alert systems on their ICBMs and their bombers to get them off the ground on the basis of what seems like incontrovertible evidence, warning. Now, as Gorbachev has emphasized, we wouldn't do that unless we were sure. But in 1983, all the people in the satellite warning center uh, near Moscow in 1983 were sure that the evidence was that there uh, five US ICBMs were on their way from field. We had had comparable assurance earlier, which had turned out to be wrong. The head of that uh, command post, warning post, Stanislav Petrov, uh, who was uh, on a night shift taking his place of another officer who was off uh, I think with a sick relative, so he was uh, not even supposed to be there. He was an experienced officer who wasn't sure that the attack was coming in, although all his subordinates were, and urged him to report um, that the alarm bells were clanging, the computer was flashing red, and that he must tell his superiors that uh, it was happening. He thought, as he told me in a message, it was 50-50, perhaps. The uh, particular warning system said 100%, but there was another warning system that was not recording an attack. And not just to cut the difference, he, he felt unsure as much as 50-50, either way. If he had reported that, he knew that uh, the Russian forces would preempt. Now, why was that? Because we'd had false alarms before and had not preempted, and that's happened later too. It's because there was a Cold War atmosphere under President Reagan, who had talked about the evil empire and had joked about it, uh, in principle, and had been conducting provocative raids into North Vietnam near the Baltics and elsewhere for reasons not yet explained, very secretly, by the way, the public didn't, even Congress didn't know the existence of these uh, provocative raids, testing their radars and their air defenses. And Reagan was in the, big, in the course of the biggest buildup of first strike weapons since Kennedy, who I work for. Uh, 20 years earlier, uh, and it was the biggest until the current one. And all this had convinced uh, Orbit Arbatov, the former KGB head, who is now in charge in Russia, that Reagan intended, intended a first strike. Now that was wrong. That was a uh, major intelligence failure, and yet not implausible at that point, if you looked at what Reagan was actually doing and saying. Uh, but it was a mistake. To assure himself that he would know exactly when Russia was, when the U.S. was carrying this out, he carried out the largest intelligence surveillance program in the history of the world. It was called, acronym was RYAN, uh, to let him know exactly when the button might be pushed on the U.S. side and the British side. Uh, this has often been noticed now that the, uh, the fact that Petrov decided not to say 50%, which he thought would result in a first strike by his own side, but instead said, it's a false alarm, save the world. A BBC program about him called him Petrov, the man who saved the world. He died a few years, a few years ago. And the emphasis has been on that. We were saved by our, by Petrov. 
almost no attention has been given to the what he saved us from, in the sense that what Andropov was planning to do, if the warning proved to be confirmed, was to preempt, was to attack us. That answered the question, by the way, could these weapons that the other side is building actually be used to attack us? Many people thought, no, it's obviously insanity. That would be a suicidal for him. Neither side would launch a, pre a preventive war and choose suicide. But in fact, each side, us just as much, was poised to preempt to this delusory, um, uh, delusory goal of limiting damage in the face of alarm. And each side got false alarms of that kind. We had had a very convincing one uh, just two year, or a few years earlier, 1979, when someone put a training tape um, in by mistake into the operational system or the warning system and uh, convinced people up the ladder that there wasn't just five ICBMs coming from Russia. There were ICBMs coordinated with planes, with submarine launch missiles at the right time, every aspect of a major all-out attack because the tape was meant to simulate exactly that. And we didn't know it was a tape until it would have been too late to deal with it. And we too were ready to blow the world up. It was at that time, 83, by coincidence, that scientists, including Russian scientists, Stenchikov and others, had discovered and revealed that for either of us, to carry out our actual operational plans against the other would burn enough cities and cause firestorms that would loft the smoke, which had been ignored now for 40 years into the nuclear era, just as we might have ignored fallout uh, all that time uh, and looked at that. Well, we'd ignored smoke and we'd ignored fire for that matter too. And where there's, where there's, Fire, there's smoke, it turns out. And this smoke would be lofted to the atmosphere where it would surround the globe and stay there for a decade. It would not rain out. It would kill all harvests while producing ice age conditions on the face of the earth. But the immediate effect <clears throat> would be the killing of harvests and the starvation of nearly everyone on earth, 98 or 99 percent. Astonishing, near extinction. Probably not extinction, according to Alan Roebuck. There would be some people in southern Australia and in New Zealand eating mollusks and fish, maybe 1%. 70 million people, that's a lot of people. Life would go on. We'd do it all again, eventually. But 98% would have gone, or 99%. That is, it's some contrast, by the way, to what we often hear of uh, by someone, by people I admire very much, Bill McKibben uh, and others, who repeatedly state there is one existential threat to human civilization, and that is climate. It drives me nuts when I read that because I think, Bill, Bill, two, at least two. And strictly speaking, I've never seen an actual estimate of where you end up with climate the effect on certain regions makes them uninhabitable with climate. Our own Midwest, uh, the Middle East, our coastal cities will be inundated, but people will move. Uh, it won't happen from one day to the next. And what is the effect on overall uh, population, actually? I've never seen an estimate. But I have seen estimates from nuclear winter. And that's 98% gone. Uh, Russia and Pakistan with an enormously less exchange, 50 atom bombs each only, not H-bombs, which they don't have unless they renew testing. Um, that alone would starve 2 billion people from the smoke, one third of humanity. Uh, the, uh, will population do more than that, by the way? We don't know. I don't know. But a full nuclear weapon between the U.S. and Russia does the whole job, seven billion, basically. To end up a system capable of doing this, which is what we have and what the Russians have, <clears throat> and poised to do it on minutes notice under possibly fallible warning of a kind that's actually occurred, is a doomsday machine. 
Uh, and uh, as I say, it's come close to uh, um, being triggered several times before. Uh, I could mention other times, 95, 1980, on both sides. Um, the very striking thing I want to go back to and mention is, Andrew, it's not the case uh, <laughs> that we have nothing to fear from Russia here. Thanks to an arms race, which we took no steps whatever to avert as we should in the 50s and 60s and late or 70s. You know, we, start, we began in the 70s, but not effectively. Thanks to that, yes, we do have a danger. No one has pointed out that Andrew intent uh, to res respond to his, this warning he was looking for, which he got by mistake through, Andrew, through Stanislav Petrov's center, would have been preemption, which was crazy, as crazy as ours, just as. We would have done the same, equally crazy. Uh, Andropov may have had an excuse, which isn't entirely reassuring. He was a dying man. He was making his decisions with a dialysis machine next to him in a hospital bed. Who knows how much that affected his psychology and his concern that this might in any case not be only his own last life on earth, but everybody's. But uh, he's not the only one you know, who could be subject to uh, uh, such a problem uh, as, as a national leader, both Eisenhower and Reagan, both, for example, uh, being incapacitated for a significant part of their time. Okay, we discuss a lot whether uh, it is feasible in the short run or whether we can even move toward it, to move the armed states toward at last recognizing their Article 6 obligations to eliminate nuclear weapons. They haven't spent an hour on that with the exception of a couple of hours between Reagan and Gorbachev at Reykjavik, uh, which were ended by Reagan's Delusional obsession with SDI. Uh, a delusion, a notion that SDI, Star Wars, had the ability to protect the U.S. Uh, from nuclear attack, as Edward Tiller had promised him. A delusion as great as the delusion held by our current president, that there's no man-made climate change, or by many of his supporters, that there's the Earth is 6,000 years old. It's a, a total delusion. Thanks to Reagan in that, his actual willingness to see nuclear weapons eliminated, along with Gorbachev's, did get that discussed for uh, an hour, a few hours, and even overnight. That was the length of it all this time. Whether or not we are close uh, to, or, or will be close, to a verifiable elimination of nuclear weapons uh, in our lifetime, or in the short run, is another matter, let me put it to side. It's not promising, extremely unpromising. Um, almost as unpromising, but not quite. Yes. There is no slight excuse for the, uh, for the existence of one or two uh, doomsday machines, with the two being coupled together by warning in a way that makes them far more dangerous than one. Okay, uh, there must not, it is possible, to eliminate a doomsday machine, starting, by the way, with each side refusing to modernize its ICBMs, which are the hair trigger to the doomsday machine. Each vulnerable to the other, each surviving only if it's fired in time beforehand, neither able to reduce the damage in any way from the other side's submarine launched weapons. And that really, and by the way, with decapitation, which essentially uh, would would uh, assure that the war would go on to the last sub-launched ballistic missile on each side. That is possible. Adam Smith actually has proposed such a thing with very little resonance in the Congress. In short, I'll just end up. We can look, I want to add one more thing. I worked at this for about 50 years uh, or more, 60 years, 70 years. And I had rarely until this year started using the name Owen or Lockheed. Uh, I concentrated on the military side of the military industrial complex, including the congressional and the, uh, and the uh, executive. But the military is what binds them all together, basically, in terms of jobs, campaign donations, 
uh, the need not for the aircraft companies not to go bankrupt without government spending. Indeed, there is no other motive, basically, for on either side. And remember, both sides have military industrial complexes now that operate very similarly. Uh, Russia is a capitalist country with the equivalent of Boeing now. To refuse to ignore the role of such corporations and to name them Lockheed, Grumman, General Dynamics, Raytheon, it would be like discussing, which many people do, discussing the prominent climate problem without ever mentioning the word Exxon. Actually, that's the norm. It's a mistake. Uh, we have to understand then, we do have this deeply rooted in our political economics right now, and that has to be addressed. The upside of this, and I'll close with this, the upshot uh, is that the chances of avoiding uh, these machines eventually going off, as they almost did in 83, 95, 79, 80, is actually small. It's not guaranteed we get away with this. We are not confronting simply ignorance. We're confronting ignorance and delusion that is furthered by the most powerful and rich corporations in the world. Militant ignorance. We are confronting a dynamic force that adapts to us as well, adapts its strategy to us as well. That's the problem uh, more challenging, shall we say, uh, but not impossible. It will take a miracle to change this, but miracles do happen. It was a miracle that the, uh, from the perspective of 1985, that the Berlin Wall did come down. That was not unlikely as of 85. It was impossible, but it did happen. And Nelson Mandela becoming chairman, uh, president of South Africa without a uh, violent revolution was impossible. And yet it happened. We are looking at problems both on climate and, uh, and in nuclear that look pretty much the same. There is resistance. Greta Thunberg and her children, Extinction Rebellion in England uh, on the climate, both on climate. Civil disobedience on a large scale is necessary, but certainly not sufficient, if anything is. Uh, it's, it has to be part of it. Over here, the Bink Kings Bay plowshares people were awaiting trial for opposing the Trident submarine. Well, testify in that, and others. Good signs, but not sufficient. Last night, I heard a quote uh, that I thought was very relevant, just I'll close with that, by Max Weber. He says, in this world, what was possible would not have been achieved if people had not, time after time, reached out for the impossible. That's what we're doing. Let's keep doing it together. Thank you. So I'm very pleased and honored to have been invited to speak today to lend the support of the global labor movement to the call for a new or maybe a renewed approach to peace. As you've just said, the International Trade Union Confedera Confederation represents 207 million members in over 150 countries. We have members in the countries that have been immiserated by conflict and also in the industries which make the weapons of mass destruction. Our affiliates in Germany and Japan have led our work on peace, not least because of their national experience of war. But our membership in the nuclear and arms industries brings a rather different perspective to our engagement in the peace movement. Nevertheless, our founding principles set out in our constitution commit us globally to a world free of weapons of mass destruction and to general disarmament and rejecting recourse to war to resolve conflict. Our members are concerned about the deteriorations described so eloquently this morning, the state of the global arms race, the retreat from multilateralism and the increasing role of big money 
in the armaments industry, as Akim said, the corporate interest. Our member unions are particularly concerned about the growth of racism, nationalism and xenophobia promoted by and fueling the tough guys, the right-wing populists, who are driving the current phase of escalating confrontation. Peace, along with democracy and rights, is one of the four pillars for action that we've set for ourselves coming out of our Copenhagen Congress last December. We want to see the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons enter into force, as well as defending the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, although we understand the drawbacks of both. And even now, the Arms Trade Treaty, given Donald Trump's recent statements, needs our backing. That threat emphasizes that our concerns are not just about nuclear weapons. Weapons of mass destruction also include cyber, biological and chemical weapons, and so-called small arms can still wreak havoc in communities and war zones. Above all, we're concerned at the waste of trillions of dollars worldwide on weapons and war when our planet and its people face challenges like climate, poverty, ill health, and growing inequality. That money should be invested in rebuilding our social infrastructure and tackling low pay. It should be funding what we call a just transition to a carbon-free economy and a fourth industrial revolution that puts people first. And just transition also applies to those members of ours employed in the weapons industry. We want to see the conversion of that industry so that people's livelihoods are protected and their skills utilised. It's slightly more complicated than beating swords into plowshares because some of it really is rocket science, but it, the objective is the same. So what can the labour movement bring to the peace movement alongside the perspectives I've outlined? First, there's our global reach, over 200 million members in almost every country and territory in the world. A presence in all sorts of workplaces and communities, including those people who don't yet buy the arguments for peace, but with whom we have an automatic connection. Secondly, we have an influence with politicians, not just on the left, especially in parts of Europe and Africa, and with employers, including putting our investment arm, workers' pension funds, into play. In 2017, we negotiated an international labour organisation recommendation on employment and decent work for peace and resilience. We do, after all, promote negotiation over war as a way to resolve disputes. Next month, to show that our concerns go far further than nuclear weapons, we hope the ILO will also adopt a convention against gender-based violence. And third, we can campaign, preferably in alliance with other parts of the peace movement like those gathered here today. Our Time to Act petition in support of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, for instance, gathered six million signatures, but we must and can do better. The peace movement has always been strongest when it mobilizes and unites with movements for, and this is not an exclusive list, social justice, equality, and democracy. Those elements are critical to overcoming the temptations affecting members of the working classes. This year, global unions will be stepping up our negotiating, our lobbying, and our campaigning for peace, because the threat is real, present, and growing, and we can't live with it. Let's get on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Owen. So our first speaker on the panel will be my good friend Rainer Brown. He has been a leading figure in the Euro European, German, and international peace movements for nearly four decades. Since 2013, he has served as the co-president of International Peace Bureau, one of our initiating organizations, and was a main organizer of the World Congress of International Peace Bureau. Thank you, Kevin, for this nice introduction. Uh, yeah, it was a great time with you. And you know, what, what better beginning we could have for such a discussion about movement building 
than to have a leading figure of the trade union speaking at this auditorium. I think this shows in which direction social movement buildings should go. But let me go <coughs> some steps back. My first point is social movements and social protest exist in all times of history against inequality, dictatorship, injustice, and all the times people were fighting for peace and social rights, sometimes more, sometimes less successful. And even today, when we are looking around in the world, we see all around the world fights of people for their rights. Let me only mention three. Sudan, after 30 years, the fight of 100,000 years, millions of people for democracy. Algeria, to overcome an authoritarian, undemocratic regime. Or look to the yellow jackets in France, which, till to quite the end, destroyed the picture of a neoliberalistic president. And I can only tell you, don't believe when public media, when media are speaking about violence. The violence in France, you could see this again on the 1st of May, was coming from the police and from the state policy. And the people were fighting for their rights there. So we are not starting at the zero point when we are discussing social movement and movement building. We have a background of activism all around the world. But there is a specific urgency to discuss questions of social movement building. And I will repeat what I was saying in the morning about the urgency by again quoting Noam Chomsky, who was saying, you know, the planet has two urgent threats. One is nuclear weapons and militarism, and the other is climate change and the destroyment of the environment. And these urgent needs and these challenges are much more urgent than 100 years or even 50 years ago, because we are really coming to a limited end of the resources used of this planet. And we always have to have this in mind when we are discussing social movement building. So it's an urgency to develop more actions and activities. But let me say that it is not possible to develop a movement at the green table. And I'm happy that this is not possible. Because movements were developed by people, by the engagement of people, and then people see the necessity and the need of to be engaged. What we can do as organizers, as peace activists, we can encourage people, we can convince people, we can help bringing people together, but in the end, people are deciding if there is the urgency for them to be active or not, and if they can overcome the daily threats by the daily living conditions under the neoliberalistic, capitalistic condition, which is individualizing the people and which is making engagement not easy. But this is the need and the activities we have to do. And we are also not starting at zero. We have day-to-day -day fights in many, many different locations in our country. We have even fights of the peace movement and peace activities. We have fights of the labor movement. We have fights of the environmental movement. And we have the huge new actions of the climate movement, above all, of the young people. These are the backgrounds we are discussing is. And then comes the question, how we can develop these intersectional, inter, uh, this coalition building between the two movements. And let me say, 
We are not discussing this because we have a weak peace movement and we have a strong environmental movement, and now we have to put it together because the peace movement is weak. No, no, that is not the reason we are discussing this. We are discussing it and thinking about it because we have common interests. We have common goals, and also we have common objections and common enemies who are destroying the environment and who are destroying peace. So this is the background for coalition building. The background for coalition building is common interest in peace and surviving of the planet, and we have the common enemy. The common enemy is the military-industrial complex, which is on one side stealing the resources, taking the finances for military building and for weapons. On the other side, there is no financial resources for the social needs and for environmental protection. And we have the same interest. Military are one of the biggest destroyers of environment. All the emissions by the tank and airplanes. And they, every war is destroying environment. So we have common interest, which is the background of coalition building. So it is something societal developed and in the society engaged. It is not a dream or a wish or to put together the weak and the poor and the stronger and the weak. It is a background of common interest. And for these interests, we have to develop the common movement. And what is the common interest of all movements? The common interest of all movements is democracy. Without democracy and participation possibilities for the people, we cannot develop movements and we cannot be active for changes. And we have to fend this democracy against all the authoritarian tendency in a lot of countries and not only in the United States. When you are looking to Europe, you can see in all the traditional democratic countries big tendency for authoritarian, undemocratic, controlling behavior. And we have to overcome this. So one common point of all the movements is to defend democracy because we need democracy as a background for actions activities. So we have to fight for this. The second point is the planet. We have a planet with limited resources. And we are overusing and misusing the resources. And when I'm looking to the plastic of today, I can again say that we are a part of the problem. And we have, when we want to really to save the problem, we have to discuss about reduction of resources, and we have to discuss about not using all resources. The limited resources of oil and gas must be under the ground and under the soil. We not, should not use them when we don't want to overload and explode our planet. And this is a common interest of peace movement and environmental movement. Because when we explode them, when we are starting these fights of the limited resources, it will be with war and with actions and with occupying other countries. The fight uh, the war in Iraq is the best example. It was a war for oil. And now, so we have the common interest of coming together for saving our planet. And I think we have a common social background. Peace is impossible in an unjust world. Peace is impossible in a world where millions and billions of people are suffering having hunger and no housing. So social rights, social development, and peace are two sides of one coin. This is the background we are discussing about coalition building. And when we are discussing this, it is obviously who are our partners. Are all these organizations, institutions, which are fighting for social rights, environmental protection, developing of the planet, and peace. And to bring these groups nearer together for their common interests, this is the huge chain challenge we are facing. And for me today, with the participation of the trade unions and of other social organizations, we are doing the first step.
But for that, and I definitely want to underline this, we need all generations. Quite often we are speaking, we need the youth. Definitely we need the youth. But this is only half of the truth. We are an intergenerational movement. We need all the generations in our fight. But we definitely need also the young people. And let me say it very clear. It is also not a question that we are taking the young people by hand and bring them to the movement. This will not happen. Every generation has to find his and her own way to actions and activities. We were finding our own way to the acti activities. Some of us, as a result of the student rebellion in the 68s, some others later on another way. And the young people will also find their way. And the climate movement in Europe, the schoolboys and schoolgirls on the street, leaving schools, striking, not going for the training, that is an example of how they are finding their own way. No teacher was saying to them, go to the street, leave the school. They were doing this because they are convinced that is the right way for helping saving the planet. And we should accept that, we should work with them together. And I'm very happy that I can tell you that we had on our peace Easter marches this year, for the first time, these young boys and girls speaking at the Easter marshes, demonstrating with us. This shows common work and co coalition building is possible when we are discussing with them. And in the declaration of these young people, they have a European declaration for against climate change. The second sentence is, we need world peace that we can solve the climate problem. But what a sentence. No one has educated them for this sentence. They found it alone, so coalition building with them and with many others is possible. What does this mean for us as peace movement? First of all, I would underline that from my understanding, we need an independent peace movement, which is acting for their main goals. We need the continuation of actions for the ban treaty. The ban treaty must come into power so quick as possible. We need own actions of the peace movement against arms trade and an end. We should never give this us. This could be as a whole activities of peace movement, also of the main work of single groups. We need the priority and the, the many ways to these questions in the peace movement. But second, we need the coalition building for the saving the planet. And let us think if we can build a world coalition a little bit under the topic, save the planet, abolishing nuclear war and militarism, and save the climate. Maybe this could be a unified agenda which has to be concretized and developed. This could be a common game and a common developing for the future. I'm optimistic because we all have the same common interests. We all feel the urgency of acting. Let us do much more than in the past. Let us, as people are also leaving, a little bit our isolated and sectarian niche, where we are sometimes so happy to be, go to the others, work with the others. We have the common interests. We can make it. Let us do it. Thank you. Thank you, Reiner.